tonight, and I thank you for coming, and uh, I know the weather's pretty hot right now, but uh, maybe we can have a hot sermon, amen? <laughs> and that, that'll cool us off just a little bit. I always enjoy going to church. Uh, I was just sitting here a while ago thinking about how long it's been since I started out in the ministry, and uh, how church has changed and how things have changed in the last few years. And uh, it's, just, it's just unusual. But uh, I do thank God that I'm able to be here tonight. Glenda said she put a picture of me on the Facebook, and it said, uh, my daddy is 87 years old and still preaching. And uh, I, I don't know what that means, so I guess when you get 88, maybe you don't get to preach, okay? But uh, I'm going to try to preach as long as I can, and uh, it's just something that I enjoy doing. And I'm going to start off with uh, a couple of little jokes to satisfy my fans here tonight. Did you hear about the robbery they had in Copper's Cove last night? Yes, it was so sad. Two clothespins held up a sweater. <laughs> oh, you'll get it after a little while. Just go hang in there. Don't give up. Uh, what do you call a boomerang that doesn't work? You call it a stick. <laughs> Amen. What gives you the power to walk through walls? Now, that ought to be something interesting. What gives you the power to walk through walls? A door. <laughs> Amen. And this will be the last one. What has one head, one foot, and four legs? A bed. <laughs> hey, you know, I probably get to preach more often if I didn't tell these jokes because I don't think the pastor likes them too much. <laughs> but I just cannot disappoint my hundreds of fans. Amen. I just have to do it and it just seems to be the way it is. Uh, I am really glad to be here tonight. If you're not aware of it, uh, my late wife, yesterday was her birthday. It was her birthday yesterday, and I didn't go down to the graveyard yesterday, but I went on Friday, and uh, everything was well down there, and uh, I just uh, appreciate her, and uh, it's, it just seems like yesterday she was with me, because sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I hear a voice. And I know it can't be true because she's been gone now for three years. But that's just how I miss her and I appreciate her. And she was a great help to me in the ministry and a very unusual person. I've never really met anybody like Peggy. She was one and she was an unusual one. Amen. Now, most of you here tonight, you know me as the sweet, kind, loving, patient, and very handsome Pastor Damaris of Victory Baptist Church. And all of that is true. But there's one thing you may not know about me, and that is I am a very positive individual. In fact, you could say it like this, I am positive that I'm positive, amen? I mean, I just have that kind of attitude, and that's the way I've looked at life, and just believe that all things were possible. So I am a very possible individual. Now, you could say, my glass is always half full, amen? And that's a positive person when your glass is half full. Now, the reason I'm telling you this tonight is because I want you to realize that this sermon may sound like it's negative, but it's not. It's positive. It's something you can hold on to, something that can encourage you. So I just want to tell you tonight that this is not a negative sermon. This is a positive sermon, and the title of it has only two words. And the first word is surviving. Can you hear the positive sound in that? Surviving. My, that's positive, and I like that. The second word is Biden. 
You can understand my title. It is Surviving Biden. And that's a positive thing. And we want to survive Biden. And so I hope you'll enjoy the message tonight and you'll get something out of it. And you may be thinking, preacher, to survive Biden, it's going to take a miracle. That may be what you're thinking. And let me say this. That may be true. But aren't you glad tonight that we serve a God that is a God of miracles? He can do the impossible. He can work things out. He can do the unusual. And that's the God that we serve tonight. So I believe that surviving is a very possible thing for you and I. Now, our text comes tonight from an individual that he himself was a survivor. I mean, this individual lived in a hard time. He went through some hard things in his life. This man's name was the Apostle Paul. Now, we don't refer to him like that. In fact, in his early days, they referred to him as Saul. Now, you know his name is sort of strange because when he was a first in the Bible, we read about him as Saul. He was named after a great king. Later on in life, his name was changed to Paul, and it sort of means the little one or the small one. He did not consider himself big or famous or what you have, you know. He was not Mr. Somebody. He was just Paul. But Paul was a survivor. He knew how to get by. And he gave us one of the greatest texts that you'll ever read in your Bible. It's one that you have probably read many, many times in the past. If you've got your Bible, turn with me to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. Look with me at this chapter 4 and look at verse 13. And here's what it says. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Do you hear that positive spirit? Do you hear that spirit of a man that says, I'm going to survive. I'm not going to let this get me down. I'm not going to be defeated. I'm going to be a victorious person. Well, that was Paul. He had a very positive uh, spirit about him. And I hope and pray tonight that you, as an individual, and especially if you're a member of Victory Baptist Church, that you will have a very positive spirit about you. Now, remember the book of Philippians is that of joy, of joy. And there's some things about joy that you find in this book of Philippians. We find that the word appears 16 times. In just four chapters, we read about having joy in the midst of problems, in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of chaos. We're having joy. And that's really something very good to get a hold of. First of all, he speaks of joy in suffering. Have you ever had that? Joy in suffering? I was thinking about my early days and I was thinking about how the hardest times that I went through, I mean when things were bad, when I didn't know what was going to happen, I didn't know I was going to make it, I look back now, and those were the good times. I mean, why? Because God was close to me. And God, His presence was felt in my life. And it made those times Wonderful now. They didn't seem wonderful then, but they do seem wonderful there now. Now, it speaks of joy and suffering, and then there's joy and sacrificial giving of oneself and one need. Now, you'll have to grow a little bit in Christ till you come to that place where you find joy in giving. You find joy in sharing yourself, committing yourself, opening yourself up to people you will find joy in that. Then there is joy in knowing Christ and the experience of His resurrection power. There's joy in knowing because He lives, I will live 
also. That's a wonderful thing. Then there's joy when harmony prevails amongst the brethren. I'm sure Pastor Knight would agree with that one. It's wonderful when God's people that are gathered together in a local assembly, when there is harmony, when there's peace amongst the brethren, it brings joy to everyone. That's a wonderful thing. And then there is joy over the finished work of Christ for each of us because it produces contentment in every situation. Because you and I realize what Christ did on Calvary by His death and the shedding of His blood and the giving of Himself, He brings contentment. In other words, I can be happy in the worst of conditions. I can rejoice because I know my sins have been paid for and that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life and heaven will be my home one of these days. So this book of Philippians, even though we read about suffering in it, it is a book of joy. Notice what it says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. If you've got your Bible open there, that's Philippians chapter 11 and chapter, I mean, verse 11 and verse 12. Here's what it says. Not that I speak in of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am there to be content. I know both how to abase and I know how to abound everywhere in all things. I am instructed both to be full, to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now think about those two verses. Just let them sink in for just a moment because what we have here is the truth that Paul had his up times. Aren't up times good? Aren't you glad when things are running smoothly? Aren't you glad when the wife is at peace with you? Aren't you glad when the kids are not getting in trouble? Aren't you glad when you got money to pay your bills? Aren't you glad in the up times? We all are. But we not only have up times, we find like Paul, we have our down times. We have our times when we're in the dark. We don't understand things. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what we're going to do. And we have those kinds of times in our Christian life. Every woman, every man, and every child, either you've had up times and down times, or you will have them in the short future. So we know that the Apostle Paul had his good times and he had his bad times. Now, remember when we first see Paul in the Bible? We see him on the uh, Damascus Expressway. He's making his way down to Damascus because he wants to take prisoners, those that are following after the way, the way of Jesus. And he wants to put them in jail or he, he wants to put them to death because he is displeased with them. He thinks they are wrong and they're doing wrong. And so on that Damascus road, we find that something happened to Paul, and I pray that that same thing has happened to you somewhere along the road of this life. I pray that it has. We find that a great searchlight came out of heaven, and the apostle Paul was blinded. He was blinded, and they had to lead him into the town of Damascus. They had to just take him by the hand and lead him into the town. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says he was blind and he had no food and no water for three days. Can you imagine what was going on in that man's mind? What he must have been thinking about? How he must have been feeling not knowing what was happening and what was going to happen to him? But then God spoke to a man by the name of Ananias, and God told him to go down and see this man called Saul. Well, he was disturbed about that because he had heard things about this man. But God said, I want you to go, 
and he was an obedient servant. You know, I'm glad that I've had some obedient service servants affect my life. Preachers and people that have spoken to me, been kind to me, been gracious to me, and helped me along the way. I'm thankful for those kind of people. And here's a man by the name of Ananias that was told to go and see Saul. And listen what it says about him. For he is a chosen vessel. Can you imagine hearing somebody say that about Saul at that time? For he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. And here is a remarkable verse. Listen, listen very carefully. For, every time you almost see the word for in the Bible, it means because of. Because I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And boy, did he suffer. Boy, old Saul paid a price by turning to Jesus and being saved by the grace of God. It cost him. He had to pay a price. But notice, the Bible says, he told Ananias, you tell him because he's going to have to suffer in his life. And those words probably rang in Saul's ears for years to come. And probably he may have thought to himself when something was going bad, God told me about this. God said this was going to happen. Now, in light of being told that he will suffer, how does he write these words? I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I mean, how can someone have that kind of spirituality, that kind of vigor in Christ to say, even though I'm suffering, I can do all things? All things. That covers a lot. That covers a lot through Christ Jesus. So I want to begin with the first word here tonight, and that's the word being content. Being content. I can ask you the question, are you content tonight? Are you content with your life? Are you content with the situation you're in? Are you content with your mate? Are you content with your children? Is things going well on your job? Do you feel content? Well, the Bible says, if you will look there in your Bible at that verse 11 for just a moment, notice what it says again. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned whatsoever state. Now, that has nothing to do with the state of Texas, nothing to do with Oklahoma, nothing to do with Georgia. That's not what it's referring to. He said, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am there to be content. Paul says, I learned how to be content. I mean, he's talking about good times and he's talking about bad times. He said, I've learned to be content. I wonder how that happened. Because I'll tell you one thing, I find it hard to be content when I'm in bad times. I mean, when I don't know where my next meal is coming from or I don't know how I'm going to get by, I don't know how I'm going to pay that debt. I mean, that's pretty hard to be content in a situation like this. Well, the Greek word here for content has the suggestion that commitment is not learned in a classroom. You don't learn content in a classroom. You don't learn it overnight. You see, learning to be content comes through a life of living and seeing the power of God work in your life. That's how you learn to be content. You don't throw up your hands and give up when something goes bad because you know you serve a God that can do all things. You serve a God that knows the good times and the bad times. You know he can give you victory in your life. And so you've learned to be content. I hope you've learned that secret because if you're not content, you could end up giving the pastor a hard time. You could give, end up giving your wife 
a hard time. You could end up giving your children a hard time because you get frustrated by bad things happening to you. But if you learn to be content in bad situations, then you will be able to do what he elaborates there in verse 12. If you look at that verse 12 again in Philippians, notice what he says. I know both how to be a base and I know how to abound. That sounds good, don't it? Everybody and you and I need to learn how to do that because he says, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry and both to abound and to suffer need. Now, let's ask ourselves a question. Is that sort of coming to true in your life? You're learning to roll with the punches? You're learning to walk through your dark valleys? You're learning how to walk, wake up and wipe the tears from your eyes and say, I'm going to make it. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to stay faithful to God. Well, if you are abounding, if you are letting God work in your life as he wants to work, that will be good. Now, this word abase and abound, we need to look at that for just a moment. To be abased means, listen, it means to disciple yourself. You know, we hate to do that. You ever, you ever stop and think about, you know, God convicts you of something and you say, Lord, I don't like that. I don't want to do that. But that's what the word abase means. It means to disciple yourself. And what it actually means is it means to tighten your belt. That means when you're in thin times, when you don't have enough for this or that, and you are, uh, are not able to buy the groceries that you want and do the things you want to do, the Bible says if you will tighten your belt, just say, you know, you tighten your belt, you feel full. You know, if you have your belt loose, you won't feel so full. So we have to learn to tighten our belt in the thin and tiring and trying times. Now, look at Paul's word here in Philippians 4 and 12. I know both how to be a base and I know how to abound everywhere in all things. I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. It was not always good for Paul. And I bet, and I'm not a betting man, but I bet you've experienced that yourself. I bet it's not always been good for you. I bet you had your trying times. You've had your times when you wanted to give up. You've had your times when you wanted to throw up your arm and say, I'm just walking away from this situation. But you couldn't because you know that God was going to be there for you in the end and he would work things out. Yet we sometimes are someone, you know what gives us the victory is recognizing that we have someone that lives inside of us. Now, every one of you in this building that claim to be a Christian, you say you've been born again, you say you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And the Bible says you have someone that lives inside of you. He's there. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says if God be for us, who can be against us? How can you talk about failure? How can you talk about giving up? How can you be, you know, sad and downhearted? When the Bible says God lives in you, and if God's in you, who can be against you? How can you be defeated if God is in you? Oh, my goodness. Even in our darkest hour, I could tell you some stories that, unless you're an awful hard person, they would make you cry. Things that I've been through in the ministry, things that have happened to me, and but yet... I know that God is always there with me. He's never left me. He's never forsaken me. But you know the greatest thing about knowing that God is in you? 
is knowing this, because greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. Who out there can defeat you? Who out there can overcome you? Who out there can drive you in the ground? Nobody! Because God is greater than anything that's against you. That's a great thing to know. That's something good. The secret for us knowing and using this truth that is found in our text here tonight is something that will help you the rest of your life. Notice again, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Our secret to surviving hard times we find in that one word, strengthen. That's the word you need to know. That's the word you need to get down in your spirit. That's the word that you need to hold on to because when your bad times go, Come, no God will strengthen you. He will strengthen you. Oh, that is so good. Now, what does that mean? Well, here's what it means. You see, God is able to strengthen us. That means he is, in, he is, in, he is able to uh, make us to adapt to his changing circumstances that are around us. You know, and he can do it without you backsliding. Isn't that wonderful? Why is it that so many Christians, when it gets tough, instead of the tough get going, the tough give up? Why is that? That's because they fail to realize and understand that God is able to empower you with that which will help you to overcome failure. He's able to do that. He's able to help you have victory in the worst of times. And that is so true. Now what is the one word that comes to mind when we think about God enabling us to be an overcomer? It's the word attitude. Do you have one? <laughs> Amen. Think about that. Think about that the next time you say something to your wife or say something to your husband or your children. Do you have an attitude that is nasty? Do you have an attitude that is bad? Did you get up on the wrong side of the bed? What's your attitude? Well, God wants us to have an attitude, and the way you have a good attitude is by what you're thinking. That's how you control your attitude. That's why the Bible says, think on these things. And he names some things that you need to think about that will help your attitude. But here's what the book of Proverbs chapter 23 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if you're mean in what you're thinking, you'll be mean. If you're kind in what you're thinking, you'll be kind. If you're lovable, if you're good, if you're sweet, those things will come out in your life. People will know that you're thinking about the right things and the good things. When defeat and despair, you ever had that? When you feel defeated and despair has taken over in your life, when you have no hope, and when no hope grips one's heart, you know what will happen? A negative spirit will follow. A negative spirit. You know what a negative spirit is? I cannot do all things through Christ. I am not more than a conqueror. That's the kind of spirit that you'll have. But when the Spirit of God is alive and living inside of you, you can say, I can do all things. I am more than a conqueror. My God shall supply all my needs. That's what God will do for you when your thinking is right. What is God giving us? Now, there's something very special. You know these verses, but in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, for God, or because God hath given to us 
the, not the spirit of fear. You know, if you live in a spirit of fear, if you wake up every day and you're just fearful, you need to recognize where that fear comes from. It doesn't come from God. God don't send fear to you. But the devil is the one that sends fear. Here's what God has given us. God's giving us power and love and a sound mind. Now, in my case, two out of three is pretty good. I'm still waiting on a sound mind. Amen? But God is giving us the, not the spirit of fear, but he's given us the spirit of power and love and a sound mind. God enables us to think right. Remember what it says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Every victory I have in my life, every time I can sit and praise God for something, you know how come I can do that? Because it came through Christ. In this flesh is no good thing. But my friends, because of the Spirit of God, I'm more than a conqueror. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It is because of who lives inside of you. Examine your heart. Is God living inside of you? Is God in control of your life? You see, not only does it take God living inside of you, but it also takes God controlling you. A lot of people say, I love Jesus, and Jesus lives in me, but they live like the devil. They're doing wrong things. They're bitter. They're hard. They're they have chaos in their life. They're miserable. But see, when you have God living in you, and the one that's living in you has control, then you can have victory in your life. The Bible says this. Listen to this verse right here. Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. You know where that's found? 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16. So God dwells in us. God will ride with you home today. God will be with you when you sleep tonight. God will be with you tomorrow. God never leaves you. He said, I'll never forsake you. And that's very important. And that brings peace to our heart. So God's presence, that would be a great sermon. God's presence. He's present with us in different situations. He helps us in the, each situation that we're facing because of his presence. Remember that verse in Psalm? I'm not planning to say this, but the Bible tells us, I'm with you. He says, I'm with you. The rod and my staff, they comfort you. The, rat, the, the rod of God and the staff. And you've heard me say this before. It is by the rod that we beat off our enemies. And it's by the staff that God pulls us out of our places that we fall into. So by having God's rod and God's staff, we stay close to the master or the shepherd. We're right by his side. He lives within each one of us. Now this brings me to my last question here tonight. If God lives in us by the Holy Ghost and we have the true word of God, why are we seeing our nation in the mess that it's in tonight? I wish I had all the answers. I don't. I don't. But I want to ask this question. What will it take if we are to have a revival? You know, you don't even hear that word anymore. When was the last time you heard a Sunday school teacher or a preacher use the word revival? It's almost like it's not in our vocabulary. To, but years ago, every church 
They were talking about revival, revival, revival. Because without revival, we sooner or later sort of backslide and get cold and indifferent. So what is it going to take to have a revival in this day and time? Our nation needs a revival. If Biden and his comrades are taking us to a place, and you know it's true, that it may be no returning from. No returning from. And yet I hear nobody talking about that situation. I hear nobody mentioning it. What are we going to do? It's time to call the church to its knees. It's time to call the church back to prayer. It's time to call the church to get into a revival spirit. We're living in the most dangerous time in my lifetime. I've never seen America in the shape it's in tonight. And I've been living a long time. If you wonder how long I've been living, I'm 87 years old. In all of my 87 years, I've never seen a situation like we've got tonight here in the United States of America. That's pretty sad. That's pretty sad. What are we going to do about it? You see, your money is losing its value every day. Pretty soon your dollar is going to be worth nothing. And let me tell you something. If you don't know the prophecy about end time, you need to find out about it because America will come to its knees in the end time. And we're coming close to that time right now. And I believe that we need a revival like we've never needed one in history. Our money is losing its value. People are giving up. Do you know that suicide is considered some people's only way of escape? That's pretty sad, isn't it? Suicide. Suicide is rampant amongst young people. And suicide is rampant amongst old people. What are we going to do? How sad is it when we think suicide is our way of out, our only hope? Did you know that this year over 100,000 people will die of a drug overdose? And yet our borders are wide open and it's coming across the border every day and thousands are dying all the time, and you hear nothing about it. Even the media doesn't talk about it. But let me tell you something. You'll talk about it when it hits one of your family members, when somebody close to you gets to the place where they don't have no promise at all, and they turn to dope to escape reality. That's a sad thing. You know, America's been an unusual nation, an unusual nation. You know that America has sent out more missionaries into the dark world. We sent out more missionaries to preach the gospel and tell people about Jesus Christ. We've given more money to help people in this world than any other nation. What if that comes to an end? What if that comes to an end? when we can't do those things anymore. Because you see, we're coming to the place where if we don't have a revival, if we don't have a turnaround, if we don't get God's people on their knees, if we don't seek God, then we'll be a third world nation. You know what they're doing in third world nations? They're trying to exist. They're trying to live. And that's what some people in America is doing tonight. I've been blessed and you've been blessed. But what if the spigot gets turned off? What if your finances dry up? What if you can't pay your bills? What if you can't get by? What will you do? You won't do anything because you can't do anything. It takes money to do about everything that you want to do. But what if that comes to an end. Well, I hate to sort of close on a depressing 
subject like this, but what should we do as a nation? Well, I believe what we need to do is a recommitting of ourselves to God, to His Word, to His church, and to His work. There needs to be a recommitting. But you know what we want to hear when we come to church? We just want to hear some little fluffy message that says, God loves you, and He's not concerned about your sin. You can just do whatever you want to, just as long as you love God. That's a lie from hell. And that's the lie of the preachers of our day. Let me tell you, God does want you to straighten up. And He's willing to help you if you'll give your heart to Him. If you'll trust Him, He has the strength to strengthen you in these hours that we're living in. You see, you and I need to recognize that we need to be filled with the Spirit. Now, I'm almost scared to ever say that because somebody will get crazy on me. But we need to be filled with the Spirit. And when you get filled with the Spirit, what does that mean? It means you have God's own life and you have God's own character, and you have God's virtues in you. And it don't get any better than that. That's the greatest, and that's when your life has the greatest meaning, and you have more fruit in your life, is when you are filled with the Spirit. And that's not just a one-time affair. In fact, the wording there means a continual feeling. We need to be filled daily. We need to ask God each morning, God, fill me, help me. When I cross paths with somebody that needs something, God, use me to help them, help me to bless them and give them the truth and may I see victory in their life. We need to have that filling of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. What we need is for the church to live in the spirit of that verse in Ephesians. Fill with the Spirit. That would be a good thing. Now, here's a verse that I want you to get a hold of, and I'll close with this. Think about this verse now. It's very important. If you don't care about America, if you don't care about the Christianity, if you don't care about lost souls going to hell, if you don't care about anything but yourself and your pleasure and what you're doing, just hold your ears, just close them up, because this verse won't help you. But if you're here in this building and there's a deep yearning down inside of you for victory and living for God and doing what God wants you to do, this verse is for you. You know what that verse is? Listen very carefully. He says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. That's what God wants you and I to do. God wants us to humble ourselves. He wants us to, you know, pray, and He wants us to seek His face. That means seek the will of God. God wants you to live by the Bible. He wants me to live by the Bible. If the church will do this, if this church here will do this, if any other church will do this, look what God will do for them. And this is everything you and I want tonight. Listen to it. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. That's what I want. I want God to do a work in America. I want God to do a work in Texas. I want God to do a work in this land. I want God to do a work in my heart and my life. And I want my church to have a work of God done in it that will drive it and cause it to go forward in these days to come. Oh, I'll tell you what. If you and I will just humble ourselves and if we'll just pray and seek His face, then God will hear from heaven 
and will forgive our sin and will heal our land. I can't ask for any more than that. That's what I want. That's what I desire. That's what every Christian should desire. We should want God to heal our land. Heal our land. May God's strength, and we're taking all of this from that one word, may God's strength give us what we so need in America is a revival. May God give that to us. And God help us to remember this one thing. And if you'll remember this, you won't be sorry that you came to church tonight. This is what you need to remember out of this sermon. God's help. God's help is just as near as calling on God. You'll have it. Because he just told us, if we'll call upon him, this is what I will do. I wish you would join me and let's ask God for revival. Let's ask God for victory in people's lives. Let's ask God to let us be overcomers. Let us ask God to give us faith that we can trust him in the days to come and live for him in the days we're in. Let's ask God to do that. And then we will know that God is near. Let's bow our heads. Our piano player is going to come and we'll be standing in just a moment. And I just pray by the grace of God that you and I will be a survivor. I pray that we'll be a survivor and we'll succeed and be victorious for none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He succeeded for you on Calvary. He paid what you could not pay. Now, let's give him our heart and let's call upon him to heal our land. Would you stand with me for just a second? When I finish, she's going to start playing. And then if you'd like to come and pray, you may not even care about America. You may not even be caring about if our nation is falling apart. You may not even be concerned about that. But if you are, you might want to take a few moments to pray and say, God, give us revival. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we could come tonight. I hope and pray that this congregation recognizes and understands we have a part in this nation. And God, you're waiting for us to call upon you. And so God, tonight we're calling upon you, the God that can do all things, the God that can turn night to day, the God that can turn sadness to joy, the God that can give us victory over defeat, the God who is all victorious. God, we're calling upon you tonight. Put a burden on our heart. Turn us around. Send us forward. Encourage us. And may we here tonight not leave this building without a burden for our nation. God, I'm proud to be an American. I'm proud to have lived my life in this great land. I'm proud to be a Christian. I'm glad that I walked down an aisle in a little Baptist church years ago. And then I'm glad that you called me into your work. I've not been that successful. I'm not that good of a preacher. But God, I've sure enjoyed doing it. And God, just help me for whatever years or whatever months I have left that I will be faithful to the very end. That God, I'll not be misled by the devil. I'll not be tricked by the devil. But I'll keep my eye upon you. And God, may we see revival. May we see victory in this great land. Bless this time of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. She's going to play. If you want to pray, the altars are open. 
You come if you can. You know what you want in your life. You know what you desire to see in your life. 